Rex Lapis, Morax, Deus Ari. Zhongli has had many names over the years. He survived and persevered where the likes of God King's Deshret of Sumeru and Remus of Fontaine have failed, and not many are aware of how colorful or how bloody that lengthy history has been. This is the unlikely Genshin Gamer, and we're going to examine the life and lore of the longest reigning entity in Tevat, besides the Heavenly Principles. Even if you feel like an expert on the Lord of Geo, there may yet be some revelations about his life, character, and accomplishments in this video that you didn't know. So, why don't I start at the beginning of Tevat's history? Because apparently, Zhongli has been around since then. Zhongli has been reported to be over 6,000 years old, and that that time coincides with the age of the Seelies. That is the literal beginning of mankind's existence in Tevat. But what's more impressive than the age itself is what it implies he both lived through and saw. The reasons he has to be contracted to silence. It's also not an easy feat for an entity in Tevat to keep his life for this long. And this could be due in part to his being the god of gold, which could very well make him invincible. But let's go back and address his origin, because it's almost certain that he doesn't originate from Tevat itself. I'm pretty sure none of the humans or gods did. Except the Fontanian ones, that is. You see, life that is native to Tevat has to originate from the Primordial Sea originally. And according to Nuvillet, the newly crowned master of that sea, only Fontaine's people, as we now know, Melazines, which really leaves me wondering about the true identity of Elinus, and Egeria can make that claim. Remus, in fact, was a god of music from Sumeru, who fled rather than bowed to Deshret's rule, and in so doing became a king of his own glorious race in Fontaine. So he has no connection to that mysterious sea besides his strange experiments with it. Nuvillet also cryptically informs us that humans of this world are not so connected to nature as they suppose. From my observations, humans have a tendency to view themselves as being in opposition with nature. And whenever this point is raised, someone is always quick to respond by declaring that humans are in fact a part of nature like any other organism. To someone like me, however, who knows an inkling of the truth, what would be most beneficial is if human civilization and the natural world of this planet could seek ways to coexist with one another. It sounds here as though they are not of the same origin, but would do well to get along further implying that the humans of this world and their gods have nothing to do with the primordial sea, and are from somewhere else. This same sentiment led Anju to try infiltrating Ankanomia to steal the book before Sun and Moon from their archives to prove the point. Even Deshret, depressed by nostalgia of a bygone era, sat longing for the paradise high above that he remembered so well his former home, perhaps. And ancient old Rex Lapis, one of his contemporaries, was said to have descended on the land from the heavens as well. So, if we are to believe that Zhongli came to this world and existed since these ancient times, then there are some tremendous events that he has lived through, including perhaps the arrival of all of the descenders. And to be clear, these would be differentiated from the rest of humanity by the fact that they are alien to the Erminsul system and cannot be integrated into it. Now, if that's so, there is no way that Morax is completely ignorant to the presence of the Traveler's sibling, unless they diligently hid themselves. You would be hard-pressed to tell me of someone he has no knowledge of. This includes the likes of Dane's Leaf, the captain of the army of the most powerful nation on the planet, and the Dragon King Nibelong. After all, he knows about Nuvillet's undeclared identity. Many domains around the world, which have locked certain environments in a sort of stasis, depict wildly different environments from the present day, 
environments that Rex Lapis has watched change and evolve. Like the rising of the seas that separated Inazuma's islands, or the massive stone towers that were commonplace across the lands at the time, or the installation of the teleport waypoints all over the world, which I think Seelys had a hand in. Zhongli represents a locked knowledge capsule containing an unimaginable amount of Tevat's history. Like, who is the outlander that the Moon Sisters got involved with? What did the Seelys look like before they fell? Who were the people that left those universal ruins everywhere? He's likely privy to the secret of what the Primordial One did to its people in the name of winning the war against the dragons. And he knows when the practice of granting visions began, which very likely coincided with the end of the Archon War. In fact, that institution is directly connected to the end of the war, and Nouvellet's observations on the matter are very interesting. From that day on, whenever a person's wishes reached the heavens, the seven overseers of the material realm were duty-bound to grant them a gift. Though they might know nothing of who or what wish had stepped into the threshold of the sacred, the seven archons still had to impart a shattered shard of their mastery to that person. And when one so gifted completed their duty, the gift the gods would receive in return would be more abundant still. This hefty morsel brings me to another point. There appears to be another component of an Archon strength that we haven't considered, and it seems to be connected to when a vision bearer dies. According to Nouvellet, it would appear that the Archons receive a return on their initial mandatory investment. How else would you interpret the greater gift that the Archons receive when a vision bearer completes their duty? That gift sounds like something even more precious than a vision. What if it's the oculi scattered abroad, which also likely relates to visions being the Latin word for eye? Or better yet, what if the process that vision wielders go through to strengthen themselves the collecting of all sorts of materials and precious stones that resonate with and strengthen their elemental prowess are all returned to the Archon whose power they borrowed. What if every vision bearer of that element who makes it to level 90 but eventually dies powers their Archon further than before? Is that the contract that Zhang Li warned us is a part of receiving a vision? Nuvillet adds that being a sovereign dragon means he does not have to adhere to such rules, but that setting aside an aspect of his mastery over Hydro to bestow on those who prove themselves worthy is something he can subscribe to. And poor Farina finally got some of the recognition she deserved because of it. All this about visions is very interesting, but what about the infamous war that created the Institute of the Seven? in which Zhongli earned his name, the Warrior God. I'm not sure how many people understand exactly how high Zhongli's body count is, but he has a lot of blood on his hands due to that horrid thousands of years long war. Liyue has the reputation amongst the Seven Nations as being the location of by very far the most battles of the Archon War. Most nations either had no actual bloody change of hands between the gods like Sumeru and Fontaine, or it was limited to a few contenders like in Inazuma and Mondstadt. Liyue had hundreds. Zhongli was said to roam the countryside with the primordial jade cutter in hand, perpetually dripping in blood, a sword whose edge never dulled. A sword that was very likely meant as a gift for Guizhou, if this description is to be believed. The description of this sword, almost without a doubt, portrays a sadness and anger over the death of Guizhou long before her time because of that war. Listen to this. They say that when Liyue first arose, Rex Lapis once walked the land with a sword hewn from jade. Despite the constant wear and tear of age, the jade edge, so bathed in blood, 
still retained a polished sheen as if brand new. The blood was washed away in the rain of a thousand years, yet the thoughts and grudges that gathered about it could not be so easily eliminated. Nephrite has the soul of the Bishui's gentle heart and will in time cleanse itself of the remnant grudges within. But who will ease the agony that the jade itself feels for having become an instrument of slaughter? These words of a friend long forgotten were both lament and sigh. But the inexorable gears of destiny would drown out these compassionate words. In the passing of many long years, many became mortal foes who once made merry together, while those who betrayed one another or fought to the death would come to share a drink, their hatred dispelled. So it was also with this precious sword, carved as it once was to be given as an expensive gift to a certain someone. This jade too was once cut for love of peace and luxury. When wine vessels are filled with blood, and when tender feelings are ripped asunder by cold ambition, and reduced to dust on the wind. Gifts ungiven and bonds unspoken will become sharp blades with which to cleave erstwhile friends. This precious gift of jade and the unspoken sentiments of his bond with a certain someone literally became an instrument of death. The jade wing spear is another personally crafted weapon of mass destruction used where Morax's Geo Whale could not succeed to defeat a behemoth god of the seas that had terrorized his people. A spear that in some way related to the massive stone bird of prey that he crafted from the mountains to plunge into the hearts of the monsters of the sea. The Summit Shaper was another of his swords, carved of pure core lapis, with which he swore to his people that all who broke the contract would be punished. The Vortex Vanquisher was again used to subdue those ocean terrors that plagued the harbor. Orobashi of Inazuma was defeated by his hand as well, but not killed, instead falling into the depths of the Dark Sea. Some even fled to the likes of Conria as their sovereign deities were mowed down one by one. Literally nothing could stand in his way. Even past friends became enemies to be dealt with other gods that he knew. We get a glimpse of how dire everything was from the battle for Chenuvale. Back then, his Millilith warriors were giants, and together with him, wherever they marched to, victory was had. The Mask of Solitude Basalt describes Zhongli's temperament throughout that war. It is said that during the years when gods contended against one another, Rex Lapis's aspect was that of boundless slaughter. In those God-eat-God battles, one could never have ascribed gentleness to him. He knew right from wrong and never missed his mark. In those days of tumult, he would show no mercy, even to friends turned foes. Rex Lapis's stone-cold expression never once changed throughout that storied age. They say that only when the dust settled did he lay down that unmovable visage. But it had been necessary, for he had donned it to fulfill a contract. A question that needs to be asked about this whole thing is why then were there so many contenders for the Geo seat? I don't know, but it must have been tiresome to have to live nothing but daily slaughter for thousands of years. This is why the Yaksha are so necessary for the well-being of Liyue now. All these undead grudges that have no place to go once the body had been vanquished are what Xiao wrestles with night and day. But as I consider this boundless track record of deaths Morax has to his name, I thought to myself, if his near indestructibility is only the product of his great strength, or if it can also be attributed to his body of gold. All the Archons we know of who died did so because of the Cataclysm. Abyss corruption was too much for them, 
or the battle itself. Nigeria and Rukidavata died in Sumeru, and Makoto in Conria itself. Venti seemed to sleep it off, and for the most part stayed out of it. And Zhongli, who was also in that battle, seemed to be impervious to it. He fought with his soldiers at the chasm to hold the waves of monsters back, but he remained unaffected. Ejda pointed out that although he is experiencing erosion like everyone else, it is to a much slower degree and that he will outlive them all. This, indeed, is a characteristic of the gold element. The fourth name of the Geo Archon, which we only recently learned from the similarly old entity Nuvilet, is that of Deus Ari, god of gold. All gold in the land of Tevat is created by him, especially the Moro. In alchemy, gold is seen as the perfection of all matter, and it was the everlasting pursuit of all alchemists to be able to transmute something into pure gold. Even at the alchemy table, Mora is a required medium for change. We can't transmute one thing into another without the addition of some gold. In this way, Zhongli really is the archon of exchange, commerce, and contracts. He's the only one who can create this perfect medium. Is this perhaps a part of the perfection that Skirk told us Rhyndotter is pursuing? Is this why she has named herself Gold? To aspire to also bring about this kind of matter out of nothing? Or to create a life that cannot die, finally eluding dreaded death? She has succeeded in perfecting chalk, but gold itself still seems to escape her. Of course, Zhongli has now lost that ability after surrendering his gnosis. But I wonder what in the world did he deem worthy of such a sacrifice? What balanced the controversial contract to end all contracts? I say controversial because there are some that argue that this was merely his last contract. He has made numerous contracts since sealing that deal with the Suritsa, and his exact wording has been used by Dainsleaf and Zhongli himself to express a decisive move he has made that will change Tavat's landscape. And the wording in itself is clear. He is signing a contract that will nullify the existence of all other contracts. Now, if we can get past semantics and consider this, it's actually huge. I've already expressed in a past video that this could include the business of visions, which are also contracts. But on another note, this action may also unseal his lips and the myriad of secrets he holds can finally be shared. The tantalizing question then is how can the Sarita and her Fatui eventually grant this? Piero seems to believe that they are going about their plan that would liberate the Archons more successfully than the Sinners of Conria, and I'm inclined to believe him. Instead of outright tampering with Erminso like the Abyss, they seem to be using the loophole of creative expression to fool the Heavenly Principles, right up until the last second. Just like Fosilors, who had them believing the prophecy had been fulfilled right up until Nuvilet had back his sovereignty over Hydro, which allowed him to save the people. The Fatui, or the Fools, are running a similar campaign. Fool, the entirety of the continent, that you represent nothing but the heartless enemy. The crass antagonist, who cares for nothing but personal gain and chaos who cruelly snatches other Archon's gnosis from them, and then, in the heart of Erminsul, the Fatui is nothing more than an enemy of the people. Certainly not someone prepared to turn around and fight to the death for those people. Not any real threat to the heavenly principles themselves. I truly believe the creation of delusions, a vision that is not granted by Celestia, and is instead seemingly a device that feeds directly on an individual's raw ambition, is a calculated move to arm the populace who believe in her cause with a way to wield the elements powerfully. And then, when the Archons are all separated from the controlling curse that is their gnosis, and the rule of the heavenly principles is challenged, 
their power will be linked to a completely different source. And even if their bodies are consumed in the process, victory will be within the grasp of the people. At least, this is my theory. Zhang Li is complicit in this plan, to the extent that he can be without alerting Erminsul, and in any case, it's not completely clear whether or not he's affected by Erminsul changes. But one thing is certain, he values the Traveler's ability to independently witness and preserve the reality of events as they unfold. Whatever is actually going on in the underbelly of Tabat's affairs, you can be sure that the Lord of Gold is a part of it, or at the very least is fully aware of what's going on. So, of course, this kind of video is meant to encourage discussion. I want to know your thoughts and theories. What do you think Zhongli is hiding? Or is he just a lazy old man now? Let's talk about it down in the comments. As always, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share for more content like this. And I'll see you in the next one.